Hey yeah. everybody, it's February 26, 2017, and this is your episode 83 of Pep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as always are Megan Arms. Hello. Laurel Black's there in Texas with Ben. Hi. Hey. hey. Charles, what's happening, buddy? Doing well, how are you? Yeah, fine, fine. So, Laurel, why did you finally leave me for Ben, as, <laughs> as, was, as was prophesized by all our viewers? <laughs> We're waiting for a... Oh, this is... <laughs> that was actually I a thought, question. I thought that was... The... Ben has a percussion festival tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll play Marimba Spiritual and a duo together, and then I'll do just a, a short little class about some of my health and wellness body stuff, and yeah, it'll be fun. Cool. Good work, Ben. And from the sub list, we've got Brandon Arve back. How's it going? I'm great. Thanks for having me back. Sure, of course. So you guys, our guest today is a neighbor of Megan's there in Missouri, and he's a professor at Lincoln University and performs with several symphony orchestras around the state. His solo CD is titled Marimba, and man, it's a great recording. You can find it on Amazon.com, lots of cool pieces, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really good CD. He's the creator of Pete's Percussion Podcast, and fun fact, he and I have shared the same percussion position in West Virginia at something called Concord University. So, hey, Pete, how's it going? Doing well, Casey. That's fun times. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So we're finally doing podcasts about podcasts. That's, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Pete, what, what are you doing so, there uh, with, uh, with Megan right now? You mean in Columbia? Yeah. <clears throat> ah, Pete lives in Columbia. Yeah. Oh, you do? I thought you guys yeah, were further, I, further, your schools are that close? My, my school, no, my school's in Jefferson City, uh, 35 minutes south, so, but my wife and I live in Columbia. Oh, right on, okay. So. And his wife teaches at Mizzou. She's a good friend of ours, too. And uh, Casey, you've well, met, obviously a pizza, but you met her, I think, when you were in town. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and Laurel has, too, because we visited West Virginia and our West Virginia friends. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is a cool moment for the the show, and I guess percussion podcasting, if that can even be called a thing yet. <laughs> I think there's <laughs> a couple of us out there doing this, but Pete has had Megan, Ben, Laurel, and myself all on his podcast, which you can hear on SoundCloud.com. Pete's Percussion Podcast. It's really fun, and so now we're finally having Pete on, and this whole thing's full circle. So, Pete, why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about just like you know, what made you want to start doing this? When I was listening to your podcast had started uh, two summers ago. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, I was listening to that and I, it was Bandcamp and Bandcamp has, is just entirely tired because you're, you're working all day. And I was cleaning my office, and I was listening to your podcast, and I listen to podcasts all the time. And from the lack of sleep, it was, I should do this. And because it was like, but I was like, oh, this is a great idea. And I called my wife, and I said, I should podcast. And she literally right back said, it's about time you figured this out. I don't know why. I think she just I, she figured I it would be fun to do and I might be good at it and and that was kind of the start. And I also knew that when we when I was going to try to do it, I was going at it at a slightly different way than you were cuz I was looking at different models like um WTF with Mark Marin or the Bill Simmons podcast or Terry Gross and things that were a little bit more um, history and person focused more than like specific to percussion field. Yours is, is very percussion field oriented, which is great. Um, I wanted to do something more that had where you got to know the people a little better because that's always my favorite part of going to conferences, of meeting colleagues, all that stuff was getting to know the things that they like that are not just about percussion. Yeah, great. It's That's a really good point, and I, I feel like I've been able to enjoy yours, of course ours, and also you guys have probably heard of Five Days with Doug. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, Doug Perkins podcast. It's yeah. it, you know, we're all doing really similar things, but they're they're just different enough that I don't know, listening to one doesn't wear me out when either making ours or listening to the other and it's just a it's a nice thing that even in such a real specific little field and such a, a niche audience because I, I can't imagine any of our audiences are that big um, that and, and will ever be that big, but that it still is really interesting across each of the three. And I, I'm sure there are other ones out there I'm, I'm probably missing too. And I bet, bet if you cross-reference our guest list too, we all have people that the other has not had on. You know, there are just so many mm -hmm. great, interesting people in the super vast percussion world. So the more podcasts, the better. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you, you know, Pete, I'd love to hear just a little bit about the nuts and bolts of it and, you know, maybe hit me with some, some sympathy on <laughs> the workload. We talk a little bit with Elizabeth Blair on that, who does the listening to ladies podcast. And we cried on each other's shoulders a little bit, just about <laughs> how much time and effort it takes. So do you have anything to add to that? It takes way more time than you thought it would. Uh, the, um, I mean, for me, I record the podcast and then uh, a few days later, I listen to it entirely back and make notes that end up being the links to the, to everything that we talk about. Um, so that's like one time through. And then I edit from that. Um, I put that all into the page that um, comes up for the podcast. And then I put my introduction and then my stuff in the midst uh, kind of around that. Uh, I work mostly through GarageBand. Um, that's pretty easy. It's on an Apple computer. It's already there. Mm -hmm. They've got a link that says send song to iTunes. So I send it to a, an album of my own. And then I have the MP3 file is made from that. I put that onto the website, load it that way. And... But it takes, that's, I'm telling you about seven hours of work, I would say. Per episode. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> that's, that's about seven hours right there. Wow. Not include, like, yeah, because the two interviews, that's two hours each for that, so. Yeah. That no, was super good. exciting, I know. Everybody, calm down. You're, you're excited. <laughs> Then you have a this bird outside my window is so excited he's trying to attack and get in. <laughs> he's like, they're talking about podcasts, you guys. <laughs> gotta get in there. No. He's just like diving at it and throwing himself at the window. <laughs> it's a little alarming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Then you got a Facebook question there, right? Yeah. Um, so you were talking about uh, a few minutes ago, like. Uh, it's you know like networking and talking to people and um, Matt Henry had a, a Facebook question. He said, "What were your highlights of the last few PASICs?" I seen the question, so I did get to think about it. It's funny Matt posed it because Matt had one of the, my favorite clinics panels that I've seen in a long time, which was this past PASIC about um, it was mostly mostly about race and politics as it relates to community music, essentially. And it was a very heated but important exchange within talking about these issues, these very specific issues that are parts of, it's parts of everybody's life in some way. It's more for some than others, but I just felt, it felt extremely relevant to, you know, the climate essentially. So Matt set you up essentially. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, that's <laughs> fine. I, I like Matt a lot. So it's uh, that works out. And I'm looking to have him on the show um, as well. I do remember, Casey, I actually want to ask you, um, there was a, a concert. I was sitting behind you a few, a few years ago. It was one of the, the Wednesday night concerts. And I remember I came up to you and it, it, and it was one of the ones that has a lot of premieres. Yeah. And I remember I came up to you and I was like, Listen, I know this is not really my music. It's it's closer to a lot of what you do. I was like, but I don't really like what I'm hearing. And I remember you said, yeah, me neither or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you remember this, Casey? Um, let's see. Well, I, I definitely know there have been instances in those those you know the Wednesday night concerts that either I I, I really like it or I really don't. But um, 
I don't remember which one that was in particular, but I've, I've definitely had both experiences, and some come to mind, and we've mentioned this before. Sometimes I get the sense that you know, just because it's new and cerebral and really hard to grasp mentally doesn't excuse you from doing regular good performance things. That was exactly the point you made. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember what the specific concert was, but that's always the thing for me at those. I feel like there's often this veil that people hide behind, and it's like, okay, I don't have to perform well, because if you don't get this, you're stupid, and that's all there is to it. You know, okay, then what? So we were talking about this last night. <laughs> um and I, I'll be uh, vague enough that this can't be traced to exactly who I was talking about. We want names. But there was uh, there was one of these performances um, at a PASIC that I was in attendance at. Um, and I'm trying to think of like ways to say this again without it being identifiable. And uh, the thought I had at the time was like, you know what, like this piece, like this music like there's not that many performance venues for this like it's not going to be on a symphony concert so this is one of the very few opportunities for this piece to be performed so maybe this is the correct venue for it but then i looked around the uh the hall at the audience members and the focus day coordinator the one who was responsible for putting all of this on was sleeping through the performance of that piece <laughs> I know what we're talking about. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, like, I'm all for pushing boundaries and all, but if the very guy that's supposed to be hosting this is completely disinterested in this piece, why is it being performed? So, yeah, yeah I don't know. That that frustrates me when there are so many great people that want to perform at PASIC, and there was this performance that, to me, seemed like maybe, maybe, potentially it was thrown together um, just based on the sort of what the piece was, I didn't think it could have been rehearsed very much beforehand. So, yeah, I just, I don't know. Sometimes things like that make me scratch my head at PASIC, as I'll always say. Yeah, well, I, I like the term pushing the boundaries because, we, of course, we all know what that means in a very general sense. But I think if you can imagine a boundary like a line, like let's say someone's tastes are right on this line and anything beyond it is beyond their tastes and you'd be pushing it into the acquired taste region. You know, if you just go all the way over the boundary, you're not pushing it because you just skipped the line. So I think young people, especially who we're trying to encourage to like new music, you can't just go from Beethoven 3 to Barrio. You have to push the boundary into that little by little. If you just skip straight to it, they're not ready for it. It's going to turn them off. Um, so, of course, you know, having these experiences myself with students, but also visiting composition seminars, speaking in composition seminars, or being a guest or guest visiting composer or whatever, yeah, like just like playing, you have to, you know, gradually build your way up to that. And, and like, um, I think it was, I think it was Andy Bliss's episode. He said, sort of like Ben said you know, it's such a good opportunity to be able to present these pieces that it's really important that you that you play it super, super well. The, uh, yep. I, I, Casey, I remember the, the performance I was recalling had to do with, it was a whole bunch of people playing on iPads. Sounds and, about right. And I, and I remember you said, it doesn't matter if you're on an iPad, you still need to perform. Yeah. That was your point, and I was like, that was what was, I mean, it was like, it was like anyone normally on an iPad. But. Yeah, well, and, and I, I think it, 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 you know, it frustrates me, because I, I do consider myself a new music advocate, you know, I mean, I do really like new music, and I, I do believe in this journey of finding this thing that is, is your own, and it's such a stronger taste when it's your own acquired taste, and not something that your teacher, you know, Mm. really said like hey this is really what you should like and this is really the stuff that is good because um, the way they rebel against that is to write cheesy pop music <laughs> like if that's what we i don't know like we gotta do the steps in the right order 
Yeah, well, and it's like it's difficult. Like even what I was just saying, it's like it's difficult for me because like you watch Steve Schick play Bone Alphabet, and like Bone Alphabet pushes the boundary, like you know, way way beyond that line you're talking about. But it's like it's cool. Like I I like it because it's Steve Schick playing Bone Alphabet. Yeah. And this other performance should have been in that same category of like, yeah, it's like way over the top, but it's. <clears throat> You know, so and so performing this, but it, it I just want it. Maybe it, just the performance wasn't good enough for me to buy it. Is all I'm, you know, all I can. Well, come Steve Schick has got like amazing performing. Yeah, jobs. yeah, that's yeah. Like, it's people, Steve Schick. <laughs> yeah, they so many. Yeah, I get really irritated and like disillusioned with our field when exactly like what everybody's saying. They hide behind the fact that it's hard. Like, yeah, we get that it's hard, but it makes it amazing when you actually say something with it and you make it very vital to our moments of life when we are sitting in that hall that we pay attention instead of just like, oh, look at that. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> How do we know where that boundary is, though? Like, Casey, you're talking about that line and just pushing the boundary. Mm -hmm. How do you identify that? I think he's just talking to your students. What do you like? You know, and, and you can find out pretty quick. Uh, we well, I think to... also like sitting sitting at a performance, like I can tell within five seconds if it's going to be a good performance or not. Like right. whether the performer is like playing a piece, you know, for some genuine like heartfelt artistic reason, or whether it's like, oh, I want to be I want to be really impressive at pacing by playing a difficult piece. Yeah, well, I, I think Brandon's question is really good. It's easy to do with your own students because you just listen to what they have to say. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. we listened to Charles Warren's spinoff in my uh, freshman techniques class, and we followed the score. More than anything, I wanted them to see the score because it's it's really, I mean, it's hard to follow. It's really complicated, and it's, it's all over the place. And they thought the score was neat. They did not like the piece. They're also 18 years old, and I, I didn't really expect them to like the piece. And then I guess the next week we listened to La Valse, and they loved it, you know. Yeah, so there you go. You start to pinpoint where their boundary yeah. is. Now, of course, at PASIC, you have no idea because you have mm -hmm. an audience of many, 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 many people. So, yeah, you just, all you can do, you don't have many options. I mean, you do what you want to play as best you can, but the key thing being do it as best you can. Don't just, <laughs> don't do what some of these performances are sometimes. Hey, so Brandon, think we, oh, I'm sorry, Pete. No, I was just I was just gonna ask you what what was the what prompts the question about the boundary for you? Oh, like why do I wanna know it? I guess I wanna know where it is so that I I, I can I can know where to start pushing. You know, because if you don't know where to push, then what's the what's the point of uh, of pushing? You might skip over the line and and not you know, not help them. You know, the point is growth. So, I mean, you have to grow from the age that they're at. I use the word age really loosely, you know. Right. Yeah, the points. So if there is a boundary, does that mean that we, like, arrive to a certain new place? I mean, I, I guess all is all in, like, kind of an a analogous metaphorical sense. So, yeah, I think so. You know, I think there's a, uh, a time when you, you take your first sip of black coffee and it <clears> tastes terrible. And you add cream and sugar, and you go, oh, this is pretty good. And then you slowly, slowly take away the cream and sugar until you just have this, uh, you know, black coffee uh, acquired taste. And like they say, yeah, acquired tastes are always tastes you keep with you longer. So I, I think it's important to find that boundary because if you spoil it for them, uh, they might be turned off to it, you know? Do you ever wonder what... Bach would think if he heard Rite of Spring. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wonder. I don't know. <laughs> like, that's that's one thing that, like, all of the progression of Western music history has been all about the basically the organization of sound, either, you know, pitch duration or part, you know, uh, pitch or duration. Um, and so, like, you look at a Bach fugue and it's it's very organized in a certain way. And then you look at Stravinsky or John Cage, and it's also very organized. And it's like, I wonder, like, what, if you could have skipped ahead a couple hundred years, like, what Bach would have thought of Rite of Spring? I don't know. Interesting yeah. thought. 
This whole idea of boundaries kind of connects to part of my topic today. The um, so my well, I can go ahead and do my topic if yeah, that's okay with it. everybody because it just really kind of fits in. So I read like another hundred pages of that book, Super Brain. Ben's gonna hold it up so he can be like me and always hold the book up when Even he talks. It's audio only. <laughs> um, so much time. And um, it, the second part is called Making Reality, and but just to connect. Um, to what we're talking about with these ideas of performance and where boundaries are. The authors of the book, Deepak Chopra and Rudolf Tanzi, they talk about there being loosely four layers, if you will, of the brain. We have our instinctual brain, which is things like, oh, look, it's a lion. I should run the other way. Or, oh, look, it's a shark. I should get out of the water. And then we have an emotional level on top of that, which you know reacts to our instinctive thoughts and then above that they call the intellectual brain which is really where we are right now which has the ability to be self-aware and to examine the world around you know so science enlightenment art all these things and then on top of that they're calling kind of an, an intuitive layer where we put everything together from the other three and we start to see everything as a whole instead of gathering bits and pieces of information about um, like emotional things, intellectual things, but you actually perceive all of it at the same time. And it almost makes me think of, you know, these students as we're pushing their boundaries, the first time they hear something, they're probably going to be stuck in that, do I like it or not phase. And then they might have a strength to which they do or don't like it, which is a very emotional thing then they might graduate to being able to talk about the piece which is intellectual you know and in the end we're all just trying to get to this place where we can intuit the purpose of this piece of music and separate whether or not we like it um and even if we do still give it a value of judgment like this piece is a piece of garbage and that's fine <laughs> you know and you're able to do that without this big emotional attachment um but anyway this part of the book really it reminded me a lot of stuff that Pete and I talked about when I was on his podcast. We were talking about theater and Stanislavski and kind of the ways in performance pedagogy to uh, take an inner world and present it in an outward way, no matter how abstract it might be. And of course, as performers, this is something we have to do. And it's something that the percussion world is starting to ask of us more and more readily with all of our pieces that are gestural and performance based um we need to start developing those kinds of chops as well and we don't really have a lot of information about that um, which is something that i think we could get from the theater world as pete and i were talking about uh, but the second part of super brain called making a reality to me has maybe four main ideas that relate to being a performer and those are perception intuition empathy and then the last one is happiness and so when i was thinking about the process of performing either from the stage or receiving a performance as an audience member there's this huge thing of perception in it um, how you arrive at the theater or the stage regardless um, is totally going to affect what you take from a performance and the authors say that there are basically three states of perception something unconscious something aware and then self-aware and so i feel like we try to take our students through that they'll show up and just play a piece execution only and then we get them to see no there is another layer they become aware and then they start to examine whether or not they can put themselves into this emotional place to perform that's when they're self-aware and that's what we have to strive for when it comes to intuition this to me is such a big thing about receiving music and performing in a way that is meaningful to different people as well as to yourself so um, as i said intuition tells you what's going on all at once rather than by little pieces and interestingly in the brain there's no one area that is like here's your intuitive spot right here unlike the audio cortex unlike the motor cortex these different things which light up very specifically as we receive information our intuition does not yet it feels like a very real thing you know like well 
I don't know if you guys have ever had an experience where you like hear a piece of music and you just get this feeling about it. And you feel like, I know that's what this is about. This is about something like that. And I remember the first time I heard Mozart's um, Sonata in A minor, the second movement from K310, it's in F major, but it is the most profoundly sad F major I've ever heard in my life. And I remember sitting there listening to it and just weeping. And I was, I just thought this is about something huge. It's this simple little thing and it's Mozart and I don't, it is not <laughs> No, it starts plainly in F major, Ben. He's making fun of me. He's saying sad F major is D minor. No, it's not. <laughs> it does not ever came into the saddest of all keys. Yeah, this is where there's like it is just tonic, right? For a little while or something. Yeah, well it's just very clearly an F major. But I mean <laughs> Wait, who ju who just threw in just F so you don't know? Who just threw in the spinal tap reference? Mm -hmm. Somebody, somebody just jumped in with that. Oh, the somebody just the saddest yes. of all keys. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that was that nice. Was well done. Uh, the saddest <laughs> keys. Anyway, no, everybody go listen to it. Look at the score very clearly. F major. Isn't um, three? Isn't that uh, sonata in A minor? Yeah. Okay. The outer movements are in A minor, but the right. Yeah, the second one's in F major. But I had this feeling of like this is about something huge and personal and heavy. And come to find out, he wrote it right after his mom died. And it's one of the few pieces he wrote that he was not paid by somebody else to write. And so that's an example of intuition. And I'm sure everybody has some experience like that with a piece. Um, but taking it a little step further, the authors of Super Braid talk about intuitive people just in general. They they just pick up on things, which makes them great audience members. Like they pick up on subtle facial cues, facial expressions. They're insightful. They're willing to take creative leaps, which I think as performers is really important. Um, you have to be willing to be vulnerable and take some risks in front of people to make what you have to say mean something to anybody. I have an acting teacher that used to say, are you uncomfortable? Good, that means you're actually doing something. Like, as if to say you should never feel like you've got it. Like, you should always feel on the edge of something. Um, and then, lastly, happiness. Oh, well, happiness and empathy. Um, there's a whole field right now of positive psychology, which is wondering, like, can we be happy? Is that possible? What is it? And um, what they found is that it is, it's a temporary state, you know, they say life has hills and valleys and the real experience is always somewhere in the middle. Um, but they have found that there are a few things that tend to make people happy and it's nothing to do with possessions or life achievements or anything like that. But it's simple things like giving of yourself, working at something that you love setting worthy long range goals that take years to achieve. And I feel like as musicians, that's just set up for us. <laughs> like, cause we're never done, you know? Yeah. Um, don't worry about external rewards and just let go of the need to want more and more stimulation and possessions. And so I hear external rewards and I'm like, oh, don't worry about winning something. Don't worry about winning the competition. It doesn't like just be you work for you and and everything's going to be OK. And I just want to say a quick word about empathy, because I feel like this is um, something that music and art can teach us that is sometimes overlooked and maybe um, undervalued by those who are not artists themselves. Interestingly, empathy does have a specific area in the brain. I learned that from this part of the book. It's called the cingulate gyrus, and it's actually larger in women than men, uh, but it's smaller. You got and... a nice gyrus, baby. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you married me for my gyrus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? But, again, but this area is also <laughs> extremely small in like people who are schizophrenic or sociopathic. So it actually is an area of the brain that helps us learn how to be empaths, if you will. And why I think this matters as performers and as musicians is as we try to take whatever inner world we have and put 
out for people to see in our performance, whatever story that might be, the process of learning and uh, creating new path pathways in the brain, they call it an evolution of the brain. Learning is not just working whatever is already there, but it actually creates new content, if you will, within your brain, which is why musicians' brains look different than others. Um, it deafens, and especially the audio cortex. But this idea of empathy, the researchers of this book agree that that's the next big evolutionary push in the human brain. So we've had the emotional push, the intellectual push, and we're now in this intuitive, like really humanistic, empathic phase where we're going to learn just how to be more compassionate, which I think is really exciting and something that, um, yeah, hopefully artists get and we can help people. It comes so, at a nice time too, where technology is so prevalent because, you know, it's like so many of us are glued into our phones and our iPads and our laptops. And I think that the natural intuition that we have sometimes is a little bit suppressed because we're so tied into these devices that we're not always aware of things that are happening um, in the humans around us, in the world around us. Yeah, so, I totally agree. Sorry to Can uh, I, if you don't mind me jumping in here, um, was there anything? Laurel in that research about beta blockers <clears throat> because that ends up being something that can dull the ability to purposefully, you know, to um, to hold back someone's uh, nervousness. But does that have, does that factor into any of this research? Right. They did not talk about beta blockers specifically, but there is a lot of talk that um, about stress which, you know, nerves are just some form of stress, that the, the only thing that can actually send the signal is, you know, your brain sends out the stress hormone and that's it. And a big part of the book stresses the mind, brain, body connection. And that it, <laughs> it's a little artsy fartsy, I realize, but, you know, with the power of the mind of like slow breathing and really calm thoughts that you could perhaps slow down your stress hormone signals and um but yeah i've never taken a beta blocker and i i don't think i ever will i'm not really interested in dulling any of those feelings yeah that's that's one thing that like that interests me is uh, like i would say in in the percussion field the the primary users of beta blockers are people taking orchestral auditions mm -hmm. i would say so um and it's like one like i've never i've never understood it because it's like I, I, I don't want to play music to the point where I'm afraid of it to the point that I have to take something that dulls that and then like it's like what's the point if you're dulling your emotions to play something that I think should be highly emotional. But so it's not I don't just know. dulling your emotions. It could be like helping you control these very small muscles that are, you know. Yeah, and I but think it's that's, like, you know, when you're playing like a really fine soft line snare between, drum. Like muscle control and anxiety and it's it's a very sticky issue, and like I don't I don't look down upon anyone that uses that, but for me it's just like, like the fact that I get nervous means that I'm excited, and I think that's a good thing, and maybe it's just that I personally, you know, don't get so nervous that it's detrimental to my own playing. I, I guess different. that could be the case for other people. So I don't know. It's it's a hot button it. issue, and it's yeah. a, it's a weird. Thing. Well, it <laughs> so, sounds like you have a like a healthy relationship between your mind and your brain. Yeah, well, and it's like you know yourself well enough to know. Like, but I remember, I'm nervous, but I'm not nervous because I'm about to fall on my face. I remember my my first performance in studio class as a master student. My knees were shaking, and I felt very uncomfortable. And I like I literally thought I was just going to buckle and fall on the floor. And uh, since then, I can remember like I feel like I've now been able to channel that. And I don't know if that's something I, I learned or if it just happened or what, but yeah. It's, but also it's, like taking a beta blocker in that situation when you're that, ner you know, when you're that physically, I think wouldn't change anything. I think over a longer period, and I don't, the reason I say this is because I've thought about this a lot, is I um, tried using beta blockers during my master's degree when I was doing a lot of orchestral stuff. And <clears throat> I felt like it was just such a very, very, very small difference that I could control that myself. And eventually yeah. I just was very... I didn't like the idea that if I didn't have one, that and 
I would feel uncomfortable or something. Yeah, like, like the, I can like control that. Concert. And, you know, I ended up not deciding to take a lot of orchestra auditions ultimately, but I, I definitely see why people do that and make that a part of their routine. And I think in the orchestral audition, like you don't want a lot of emotion and anxiety yeah. in there. You know, it's very, you really have to control everything. Um, I, so I see why people like the, do it. But. It reminds me of like the pre-concert ritual we talked about with Colin Hill, like where totally. if you don't do it, then all of a sudden. Totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But so one thing I, I haven't ever researched it. Do people build up tolerance for, for that? Like, do, do you need to take more? Or is it less effective over time? I'm just going to jump in here and say that I take bl uh, beta blockers almost not every time I play, but I figured I wouldn't say anything to, you know, taint the conversation here for a second. Way to go, Ben. You made Brandon feel like shit. <laughs> no, I don't feel uncomfortable at all. See, he's uh, even backlit the whole time because of that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Like, I don't want you to see my emotions right now. Way to go, Ben. <laughs> <Jeez>. <clears throat> yeah. No, well, how, like, like, this is interesting. Like, how did that start in... Like recently, or have you done that for a long time, Brandon? Uh, you know, I can't pinpoint when it was, but there was something I think that happened like in a musical performance early on, uh, maybe in like high school or like my undergrad, first year or so of undergrad. And, and like I said, I can't pinpoint it, but there was something that freaked me out on stage. You know, you get that fight or flight moment, like Ben's talking about, you get shaky knees or something. I didn't get a shaky knees or anything, but it was all, I think, more psychological than physical. Um, and it was the heart racing thing, you know? I, again, I'm not, I can't tell you what it was, but I knew that, like, uh, psychologically, I was being a little bit perceptive of myself, and I could feel the heart racing, feel my breath getting shorter, and I think I psyched myself out in whatever that moment was. Uh, and so I had some some people around me at the time that were discussing beta blockers because they were on it, you know, and talking to my doctor about it. And I think that's an important thing, of course, talking to your doctor before you decide to do something. Um, because where else are you going to get your beta blockers, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, I decided to try them and experiment with them in like a lessons kind of format, you know, just see what would happen to me if I go to play for, you know, something that had a little bit of an edge to it, playing for a prof uh, professor. And it seemed to work out for me. Uh, again, I don't think mine was necessarily a physical thing. I think it was a psychological thing stemmed from a physical reaction, if that makes sense, because I was yeah. being self-aware. Um, you know, and there are still times where I feel like, man, I, I feel like I'm going to be nervous for this. And I, I feel like uh, maybe I lean on it in certain moments. I mean, there's plenty of times where I'm actually in the orchestra here in Lexington and I don't need it at all. You know, uh, I, in, in a lot of ways, I think it's a, a psychological thing, like a, a, a prop, you know what I mean? Yeah. To help yeah. you through the performance. Um, and that's one of those things, you know, somebody asked, I forget who it was, like, do you become immune to it or do you have to start amping up and get more? And for myself, no, I've always, if I take it, it's always the same amount. It's a really low dose, you know, it just sort of touches your nerves, if you will. Um, so, you know, a beta blocker does nothing but control your blood pressure and keep your heart rate down in a moment of fight or flight. So um, mm -hmm. all that happens is like, I'd never get to that point where there is a, a choice to be made of fighting or, or fleeing. So I just feel more comfortable, you know? But I, what I find to be interesting is I've had uh, a change in, my, in the effects of them. It's like at first when I took them for a couple of years, uh, I would not really have any issues. I could be up there and feel like I was all by myself on stage, you know, and I could be free and open to do whatever. Uh, but then, you know, Ben, I think maybe you said something about how it might change you over time. Um, but then I started to notice, like, okay, cool, the physical aspects are are settled now. But now I'm being self-aware of the psychological thing, you know? Like, the self-talk doesn't go away because of beta blockers. And I think that's, like, the, the next challenge for people like myself. And I would love to, like, get off of doing that, you know? I think part of it might be ego, you know? Like, you don't want to mess up in front of people, and I think, like, having that certain level of comfort is uh, what, like, 
why I may be going to be comfortable out there. I didn't like that the edginess. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I wonder I if, if it would. Sense. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Brandon. I, the one thing I thought about is I wonder if woodwind players, a group of woodwind players, would have a very different discussion about this because mm -hmm. if their breathing is so important to their, like an oboe player, yeah, is so important to their thing, I would bet that they would welcome beta blockers much faster than us who use our hands and arms. Sure. Yeah. What Ben was saying earlier of, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want music to be at a point where I, I have to do that. And I think, you know, since they're so talked about in the, or, you know, the audition circuit, I think people on the audition circuit are so serious about, it's not about music at that point. It's about oh, yeah. Playing. Yeah, I mean, they're not. I mean, you not. could argue it, but but it's it's just so competitive. It's, it's just so insane it's like how competitive it's got. Competitive. It's insane. Yeah, and and they're and of course they want to make music ultimately, but that's not what you. That's not first and foremost at the audition. You know, it's like no, just win, <laughs> just win. Yeah, and like what you know, what we do, you know, is also very competitive. Getting a college teaching job, but at the same time, there's so many factors involved with that. You know, how you play. How you interview, so many things are considered, you know? Personality, that are yeah. Much more, you know, relative to the whole person in there. You know, you don't see their face, you don't hear their voice. It's like just. So, yeah. So. so, if you guys aren't using anything to sort of help your performance, what, uh, what do you think people like myself and any listeners uh, well, that do have that kind of aversion to the edginess? Like, what can we do to help ourselves? Ben's got it. So uh, Matt Strauss had this great point for that. Uh, Matt Strauss, who plays in the Houston Symphony, he teaches at Miami and Rice. Um, he told me in a lesson, he said, you're never not going to get nervous. Right. And so he was like, so you just have to figure out how to deal with it. And like, how do you translate that into something positive? But I think we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to eliminate nerves. And it's like, like, I've heard Michael Burrett say, like, he still gets butterflies in his stomach, and it's like, that's not going to change. So figure out how to turn it into a positive. And for me, like, now when I'm backstage, I'm not like, oh, God, I'm about to go and I might mess up. It's like a positive experience of like, oh, I can't wait to get out on stage and do my thing. And, like, one of my favorite things is, like, whenever I've seen Michael Burrett play, like, he doesn't really walk out on stage so much as run out on stage. <laughs> like, you can tell he's just pumped to get out and do his thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, like I said, it's been an experience of channeling the energy in a positive way. I think, um, for me, I still get nervous. It's interesting, as I get older, I think I care more, and I get more nervous than I did when I was younger. Well, and you're like, I'm old, I should be good at this. I my know, student, yeah. My students like, should think I'm yeah. awesome. <laughs> I gotta not screw this up. Um, I realized that the, the half marathon training I was doing was helping because that physical sensation of like, my breathing is high, my heart's racing, I learned that, oh, this physical sensation, that's all it is. And I can separate that from, you know, any type of thought process that I'm having. And I realized like, oh, I'm at mile nine, but if I just stop and walk for two minutes, it's all back down to normal. And of how quickly that can change, it helped me realize that, you know, all the deep breathing that people talk about, it actually really helps me. And so when I feel those, that physical sensation like backstage or wherever I am I know that that's all it is and you can just calm it down a little bit yeah I also um to connect to the like the intuition of my topic just a little bit I think anytime you can connect to the deeper meanings of a piece and if you care more that you tell that story or share that feeling Anytime that is the more important thing than just playing well, it's going to be better. And I've shared that with a lot of students, and everyone says it helps them. And the singers in particular have found that helpful. And, you know, they their breathing is like their whole shebang. So, my, you know, Brandon, if, if you were my student and you were asking how, what, what are your recommendations to help with nerves at this point, my prescription would be to do some 
uh, series of, say, studio class performances and or recitals, some type of public performance things that are not super difficult pieces and pieces that you can just knock the heck out of. Low this, stakes. Sorry? Low stakes. I, yeah. Low stake yeah, performance. Right, low stake pieces. For example, we did this, we, we had the Virginia Allstate thing yesterday and we played this this piece for for wind wind ensemble that had two faculty little little solo trios and I played these like, like four bongos and hi hat, snare drum and hi hat in each one and it was just kind of rocking and the the other parts were solo parts were very difficult, but my, mine was not. I mean it was like a ton of boom chick, cool, groovy stuff. Uh, the kind of thing where you can look at four bars and just like watch the conductor look around. It was like really easy just to to knock the heck out of it, and it was really fun. So yeah, low stakes performances so that you build that whole confidence confidence thing, and that you do a really good job that builds up your confidence. I feel like people have to have successful experiences before their their confidence will um, exist. I just yeah. want to jump in real quick, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, the one thing, I, I, Casey mentioned this in one of the previous episodes about talking about or being backstage and cr cracking jokes because that's what I used to do, particularly during my, my doctoral recitals and uh, and because you're like all fired up and everything, but you got to get some of that energy off of you. And and you're also in a, generally in a good mood. So yeah. uh, I that I finding an outlet like that I would just be look at the stage hands and be like, Are you fired up? And they'd be like, Yeah. <laughs> like, yes. Like, Let's go. Yeah. And they weren't playing, but I would yeah. just rip on them like that. But it was, it was something I I appreciated that when Casey mentioned that recently. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. You know, Eric Hollenbeck was my professor out uh, Colorado State when I got my master's. And that was kind of a, a similar thing. He would always say, like, if you're in an ensemble setting or something, look up at each other and smile and and just that little, that moment of, you know, looking at each other and, and smiling kind of is settling, you know. But, uh, you know, what I, I think is kind of interesting that I'm thinking about myself here and when I get nervous, I, I'm not trying to make this about myself, but I'm the, the test subject here, I guess. Um, but I, I think what I get into is, like, it's not performing that's the problem for myself. I think it's about uh, some level of um, you know, preparation. I, if, maybe if I don't feel like I'm prepared enough for the performance mm -hmm. um, or just the difficulty in the part, you know, I think like we could, we could walk up in a, and play simple bass drum parts and nobody would get nervous, you know, but if you had to walk up like Laurel tomorrow and play Marimba Spiritual, uh, you know, I, I think that's different. So I don't think it's about being on stage. I think it's about, you know, preparation and uh, yeah. just difficulty of parts. For me, sure. Well, and I feel like at recitals, I mean, we've all been students for so long. We're always pushing what we can do. And we're always playing something that's just out of our reach. But it's also really important to, to do things that are well within your reach. And not only can you play everything really well, but you can, like, play the living heck out of it. Yeah. Right. So I have a question for Megan. Yes. <laughs> about preparation and getting nervous. Were you nervous before you just passed your DMA exams? I was so nervous. <laughs> Thank you. That was like one of the biggest hurdles I feel like in my life the last 10 years. <laughs> just, I don't know. Those Eastman comps are like, people are talking about them the first day you arrive on campus at Eastman as a DMA student. And like, oh my gosh, it's just, it's just really hard. They're just really hard. <laughs> And yeah, so I was super nervous and, you know, it's interesting because I did feel really prepared this time and that made me more, actually made me more nervous because I was like, I have to pass this. I spent so much time preparing for this. Like if I don't pass this, I don't know if I can do this again. Like, I don't know if I can bring myself to carve out this time to study all this stuff again. Um, so I was super nervous, but anyway, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's over. Yay. <laughs> So for, for some of the younger listeners that are out there, and I guess myself too, I've, I've never taken exams like this, and I don't have a DMA, what, what, is, what do these exams consist of? Yeah, well, for this portion, as the DMA comprehensive written exam, and it was 14 hours of um, written exam 
split into four different sections. Um, the first is terms, and they can be terms from any time period uh, in music history ever up to like today. Um, the second is, and you have to basically, you can't just like define them, you have to write paragraphs about them. The second is um, uh, an essay where also, you know, and anything is fair game. They give you a couple to choose between uh, and you write for four hours, basically. Um, the second day is uh, a little more theory based. There's an analysis. You have a tonal and an atonal piece, typically, although they don't they don't say that. Um, and you and actually mine. Yeah, I had Bartok. Um, that was the one that I chose. It was from a piece from Microcosmos, and I was like, yes, okay. I had analyzed a couple of those before. It's awesome. Felt good about that. And then um, finally, score ID, where they give you four scores from different time periods, um, and they could be anything ever. Yeah. Uh, I had an isorhythmic motet. Um, there is a trio sonata, um, it's a Messiaen piece, and you have to guess the composer of the time period, write an essay about it. What is, so, what is up with their obsession with, like, really old music? I mean, you know, for Laurel and I's job and Pete's job, we all taught at Concord at one point or another. I mean, we each taught a, a music history section, and I happened to teach the latest one. I happened to teach three. Laurel was teaching two. <laughs> And I can imagine if we had to teach one, okay, we got to study up a little bit. But I, I mean, I, I just don't. Can yeah, you I mean, like, what's the deal? Like, do they? The, you're like, you're a percussionist. I'm a percussionist. We're probably not doing like scholarly research on Lassus. And there's not, of course, there's nothing wrong with Lassus. But like, why do we have? To, I'm sorry. Why do we have to know so much about Lassus? I think you got to know something. But holy, like. I, I know, to... man, Casey, I mean, we could turn this into an entire podcast. I mean, I yeah, could I mean... talk for hours about this, but I will say that I just talked to John Parks on the phone yesterday morning about this, and, you know, he said, you know, just wait in retrospect, like, this made me a lot better teacher, um, even even in percussion, and it, it teaches you a, a way, it gives you a very, very, very broad understanding of the history of Western music, and that it will... Um, he says things that he learned from that exam and in preparing for that exam have seeped into his teaching and that um, in retrospect he really appreciates um, appreciated the time he put into it and and so I do not feel but, that way right now right. <laughs> at all but, <laughs> you were to, I, I mean I would I, I'm sure he's right and I will defer to his expertise because he's much older and wiser and more accomplished than myself but if you were to spend I would argue if you spent the same amount of time studying expert chess players that couldn't help itself but seep into your teaching and become yeah. so relevant because what we do is right. so ingrained in our lives right so i don't know i part of me has this i guess the cynical side of me has this uh fear that it, it's almost like these people are just validating themselves and what they've spent their whole lives doing by making this so important for you to pass I, I don't know. That's, that's yeah. totally And also, you know, I also, this, you know, could, does could like kind of lead into a conversation about test taking and the way that people, you know, um, not spit back knowledge, but prove their, their knowledge of a subject area because I really felt, yeah, I mean, you look at my transcript and I have, I have A's in every single class. This test was so hard for me. Like I, yeah. I, I, I don't think that I'm like a written test taker, especially in subject areas that I, you know, I'm not living every day and I would much rather express myself in different ways and I would have rather done a different type of project to show that I knew this information, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was really frustrating to me because I felt like I was stifling my creativity. I felt like I was not doing my, you know, I feel like I couldn't do my job to the fullest potential of what I wanted to do here, you know, they don't make it very easy for someone who has a full-time job and, you know, is trying to have a performing career as well and has lots of projects because you have to study for six hours a day for four months, Yeah. <laughs> six months, they say. So yeah. anyway, we should well, probably move on before sure. I like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's awesome. So, but it's over. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Way to go. Congrats. Um, when uh when when I knew Pete was going to be a guest on the podcast, um 
I was researching because normally I present on a piece that's sort of someone's, you know, specialty sort of piece. Um, and so I was trying to figure Pete out and figure out what his uh, his big marimba solo was or multi solo or whatever. Many people have tried to figure me out. <laughs> you may go. Um, and so I like I was on his website and I came across his like CV or whatever. Uh, and he did his undergraduate degree in piano performance. And not only that, but his uh, dissertation was written on, or thesis, whatever, was written on um, piano transcriptions on marimba. Um, so could you tell us about some of your research with that and what you ended up finding out? Yeah. Um, my my um, advisor and mentor, Corp McLaren, had it was kind of his suggestion that to go in this form and to try to combine the two degrees and the two focuses that I had had as a college student. And so we, we were looking at, we narrowed it down to looking at what has been published for piano transcriptions on marimba. I looked at solo piano pieces that became solo marimba transcriptions, so that eliminates a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I went for published, so that obviously is going to eliminate a lot of stuff. And was just trying to figure out what, how people who did the transcriptions handled some of the the inherent issues on piano. There's lots that are similar. I mean, we're striking an instrument. We have we we have to deal with hand independence. We have um, issues of decay. We there's things like that that are that are common. Uh, we read off a score in the same way, but we also uh, we have to deal with the fact that piano has ten fingers and marimba has four essentially. And so, how do you deal with uh, chords that have more notes? And how do you space it out? And how do you deal with the range problems? And how do you deal with the fact that we have to roll to extend sound, but piano just has to hold, uh, you know, the pedal down. So you're looking at trying to figure out the ways that they dealt with it. And there were some pieces that worked really well because it didn't require as much out of the instrument primarily, particularly with sustained stuff. And then there were some other pieces that really did not work at all because they were trying to, a lot of it was trying to reduce something that had no business being a marimba transcription. Um, and I will mention a transcription of uh, Claire de Lune um, for four octave marimba. So figure, just, <laughs> just let that sink in. Um, and it just, there's nothing about that transcription that revealed anything about the character of the piece. There, now, there are parts of that piece that actually can work perfectly well. The very end can fit in the range and actually is, is thin enough orchestrally to work for marimba. But there's lots of sections, and if you know the piece, there's a middle section that requires sustenuto pedal, and it's both hands are moving all the way up and down the keyboard. It just, it's nearly impossible to create for one player. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of a comp, just looking at the how arrangers and transcribers tried to figure those things out. Yeah, great. Megan, there's something happening. Oh no, happened last night involving. Pan Festival, is that right? Yeah, so who stayed up late last night to see who won the Panorama uh, finals in Trinidad and Tobago? I went to bed about 8.30. <laughs> we got in no at like 12.30. No <laughs> one stayed up. I didn't stay up either. That's why I was nope. like, <laughs> but, um, so last night, the uh, large steel pan competition in Trinidad and Tobago, of Trinidad and Tobago, um, Panorama, happened last night, the finals. Um, and there were 11 groups that made it into the finals that were that were ranked here. Um, I'm just gonna list the results here real quick. So, starting in the left, we have the Tropical Har Angel Harps um, performing their arrangement single with arranger Clarence, Clarence Morris. And you'll notice, notice here, I'll give you a little background about Panorama in a second, but. You'll notice that um, the most important things about these categories are the name of the group, 
um, the points they scored, which I won't even bother listening, listing the name of their arrangement. Um, and then the arranger that's huge. It's like whoever's arranging these two, um, their, their performance. So the tropical harp angels, angel harps in 11th place, um, with their arranger, Clarence Morris, 10th place, the supernovas, um, performing rumble in the jungle. Um, Amrit Samaru, number eight, did I skip one? Nine, number nine, Starlift, Good Morning by Robert Green Greenidge. Eighth place, Phase Two, Pan Groove, Red, White, and Black by Len Bugsy Sharp. A lot of you might um, recognize his name. He's been in the game for a long, long time. Seventh, <clears throat> Skyfall or Skiffle, not sure, Good Morning. Um, three Rangers here, Mark Brooks, Kendall Williams, and Odie Franklin. Sixth place, the Silver Stars, We Are Conquerors, and Liam Teague. We all know that name, right? He's the steel band teacher up at Northern Illinois University. Yeah. Um, huge in the steel band world in the United States as well. Um, fourth, fifth place, the Invaders, Full Extreme by Arden Herbert. Fourth place, Exodus, Good Morning, um, Pelham Goodard and Terrence B.J. Barcel, third place, The Renegades, with Good Morning, Duvon Stewart was the arranger. Second place, The Desperados, performing Good Morning by Carlton Zanda Alexander. And first place was the Trinidad All-Stars, performing Full Extreme by Leon Smooth Edwards. So this is not in the semifinals round. Actually, the top two were switched. Um, Desperados were in first place and Trinidad All-Stars were in second place. So it was pretty exciting competition last night. Um, the semifinals were held on February 12th and that was an 18 hour musical marathon. So there were oh small God. groups. Yeah, there were small, small, um, small groups, medium groups and large conventional steel orchestras uh, performing in that 58 different bands. And they, they began that day around 9.30 in the morning, and they ended the next morning, February 13th, at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and so they joined 15 bands at the, the exact same venue. This is held at uh, Queens Park, Savannah, in the Port of Spain. One group I wanted to mention that didn't make it into, that didn't make the finals um, was Birdsong, which is a great large conventional steel orchestra. Maybe some of you have heard of that group. Um, but this year, their arranger, her name was Mia Gormandy. I don't know if there has been a female um, who's been a band leader and arranger before. Uh, I don't know about that. I should research to see if that is the case, but I definitely have not seen that in the past few years that I've follow been following. And um, Mia was also had studied with Liam Teague at Northern Illinois and was also at Florida State, which is where I met her um, running the steel band there, but Mia Gormandy. And she uh, was new for this year's uh, arranging. And this was her first panorama outing as an arranger. And um, her review is that Miss Gormandy delivered a very competent and noteworthy ver vision of the band's tune of choice. So it sounds like she was well liked and hopefully we'll see her uh, continue in that scene in the future. Um, let's see here. So in the final, okay, actually, I just want to go back big picture here for just a second. So if any of you are curious about this panorama competition and want to, want to hear about it through the eyes of an American, last year, uh, Brett Morris, who is a Truman, uh, student up at Truman State University, just from the, up the road from us here in Columbia, um, and another student, Marcus Rattler, went down to perform with the Silver Stars, Liam Teague's group. And Marcus went down again this year, I believe. But Brett wrote a really nice article for Rhythm Scene, April. So April 2016, kind of talking about his experience there. There's some nice video footage he just took from his iPhone, you know, so you really feel like you're there. Um, audio examples and pictures of his experience. And it kind of gives you an outline of what the weeks leading up to Panorama are like in the pan yards there. And um, also that excitement of the actual festival. I, so I thought this was really timely because Pete actually taught the steel band here at Mizzou for a couple of years. Um, so he also knows some things about steel pan. And um, so I thought that was cool and, and very timely that that he was our guest for today and that this just happened last night. We also had a party here. We have a steel band at Mizzou and Abby Rehard is our teacher. She studied at NIU with Liam 
and um, she's she's fantastic. And so we had a panorama watch party last night. We watched some of the middle-sized bands um, in play in the finals last night, and she cooked some food from, from Trinidad, and um, it was a lot of fun. So if you haven't experienced this competition before, if you just Google panorama, you can see a lot of these groups, and it is really exciting, fun music, and just... You can a lot. You can really learn a lot about Trinidadian culture by by checking out some of these groups. Wow! Thanks, Megan. Way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Jason Kuntz might be like co-director or something at Birdsong. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, I, I've gotten emails from him I in the past him. looking for Americans who are into steel pan. Um, yeah. You know, asking if it just comes at a, like a, kind of a hard time of the year for us, right? Because. You could go down maybe and compete in semifinals, but if your group is in the finals, it's hard to be out of school for yeah. two months. Should have just is, uh, skipped studying semifinals? for the comps. Semifinals this year was February 12th. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you have to be in Trinidad, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, a lot of these groups teach music by rote, and so, like, you, the, 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 sometimes the arrangement is changing, you know, and it's being taught by rote, so, like, you really you can't just... I don't think you can fly in the day, you know, learn the music and fly in the day, day or four, two before. Sure, sure. Hey, well, Megan, you were going to ask Pete a question about his yeah. speeches. So I think I definitely wanted to bring this up um, because I think it was episode two that I talked about East HBCU drumlines. It was, uh, it was no, it was somewhere in the teens, but you did mention it. Yeah. We had just had the event. At, yes, in, uh, at Normandy. Lincoln. Yeah. And, and at Normandy, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. I have to ask Pete because he's he's he knows every episode. It's so amazing. He listen to every single episode. I love it. Sometimes I'll see him at happy hour or something, and he'll be he'll be like, mention reference something in the podcast. I was like, oh man, you're so amazing. Um, Way to go, Pete. So uh, in one of the earlier episodes, I, I mentioned HBCU drumlines and that our drumline at Mizzou had collaborated with Pete's drumline at Lincoln University to play at this festival. Um, in Ferguson, Missouri last year. And so yeah, Pete teaches at a historically black college and university. And I'm just curious about your experience um, teaching at that university, but also in running the drumline. And mm -hmm. that drumline is not, um, you know, the same as the drumline style that we think of in uh, SEC universities, sure, for example. Yeah, yeah. So if you could tell us about your experience doing that. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, it's the drumline experience is, it's very different, but it's also, there's a lot of similarities. And when I got there, I don't know that I knew that how extensive the drumline um, schedule and, and, its, and its importance was until I started working there and got, and then I understood. Um, because the, it was, a, it's a huge part of the university. Uh, the band is a huge part of the university. It's the largest ensemble of note in terms of uh, getting your name out there, getting the school's name out there. It's what a lot of people in the community know about the drumline because we play a lot of community events. But it's also what um, a lot of our recruiting comes from videos that have been posted of our performances. We do at this event, uh, a lot of the drumlines that we saw were, some were high school, some were community drumlines. Some of them play our cadences right back at us. Uh, because they'll watch footage of us playing something and they'll go back and learn it. Hmm. And, and we actually have, have done a lot of recruiting that way because they see us online and then they, they see us in person and then you know, they, they want to come in and, and come to the school. And uh, it was definitely a huge, um, it, it, it was a steep learning curve for sure that first year because all of the cadences are uh, by rote, are taught by rote. There's little bits of things that are written down here and there, but you basically have to learn the cadences by being around the cadences and hearing them and, and then hearing all the variations and what everyone has to do. And uh, that took a little while, I'm not gonna lie, but um, the thing that's been great is that the kids have generally been really, really cool about me being there, I mean, I'm not a, they know that I'm not a person that had, you know, studied this or worked in this kind of line, but they knew that I could help them out, and I did the things to kind of help them out right in the beginning, and 
one of the best experiences I had actually my first year when we were we were getting ready for a, a drumline battle against uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff for their um, homecoming. The guy who had been the director for years had, um, but he was a student there, um, but as someone who was actually my age, we were having a rehearsal and I was pointing things out and he was getting mad that the students weren't uh, getting everything or weren't paying as much attention to the things I said. And he actually told them, you need to listen to him. He's, he's hearing things that I don't and he's fixing those things. So pay attention to what he's doing. And that meant a huge amount to me. Uh, his name's Caesar. He has a drum line in St. Louis, who's incredible. And uh, uh, the Warehouse Warriors. Okay. Uh, you would definitely know who they are. They are. Uh, they at that show? They were. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, that that just kind of helped get me over the edge a little bit. That I didn't, I didn't know that I needed, but I look back and that was kind of really important. But generally speaking, um, everyone's been great there to me, and I've been really lucky. Yeah. Absolutely. Them. Cool. Wow. Um, I, did, I guess I just had, I don't know, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about this, and I had another question, I can't remember what it is, but um, I guess, well, okay, I'm curious about how um, the students' experiences in the drumline and learning music early, um, and how that, the ones that the, who are also studying music, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you? How does your pedagogy change um, from teaching students who are in a drumline like that? Mm -hmm. um, do you teach things early in the classroom? Do you feel like they're weaker at reading music, or do you think they're just as strong? Or how does your pedagogy change based on your experience in this drumline? The uh, uh, it depends. Obviously, um, a lot of the. A lot of students haven't haven't been in band programs that did a lot of concert band playing. They've done a little bit, uh, so a lot of them their reading skills are it's there, but they they either haven't tapped into it in a long time or they just don't spend a lot of time doing it. So, um, but like in lessons, we do we we read music. We there all all these students are in concert band, so they when we do that in spring, so. Uh, they're all reading music there. They're at, they tend to ask a lot of questions, but usually they they figure out the parts pretty pretty quickly. Um, and then the students that I teach as private lessons, um, they end up being kind of the leaders in that section. And actually, teaching them in private lessons only benefits their um, working with them in the drum line because they know that I how I work, and they know that they've gotten better working with me. So like they're more apt to listen to what I'm talking right. or saying to them. Right, right. Um, but it's more about, um, we do during the year, we, they do read one or two um, written out parts for some of the marching band stuff. I asked our, our ranger to do a lot of, to write out the parts so that they get, they have some experience doing that. Yeah. Um, but it's not a lot of what we end up doing. Okay, how many years have you been there now? This is year nine. Awesome, mm -hmm. yeah. very cool. Wow. Well, hey, you guys, thanks so much for helping me do episode 83. Uh, big thanks, Pete Sambito. It's awesome to talk to you again, buddy. Yeah, man. You too. Yeah, and all, yeah. I, Brandon, I guess I'm. I guess you're up next. I guess so I can complete the collection. <laughs> That's right. I have I'd all the glad. main hosts now. I, now yeah. I can start with the, the secondaries. The, yeah, the sub list grows, grows stronger every day, too. Megan, <laughs> congrats on um, passing your exams. That's great. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, congrats. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. that's awesome. Brandon, thank you for joining us. And Yeah, thanks for having me again. Yeah, you're welcome. And Ben and Laurel, I hope you guys just have a happy life together. <laughs> <laughs> this is <Okay>. getting weird. <laughs> no, no, keep making it creepy. Come on, step it up. But, but seriously, good luck with your day of percussion there in Texas. And yeah, play your brains out, Laurel. I'm sure it'll be awesome. Did the shirt fit? We don't know yet. We haven't tried it yet. Yeah, we got in at like past midnight last night because we went to dinner in Dallas. So, um, yeah, nice. this is our first day being in Stephenville. Laurel, Thank you everyone for getting shirt. up early to accommodate my schedule. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, hey everyone, we'll catch you 